Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to warmly welcome you to CNBC TV debate, where we will be talking about the big deal. Do the emerging markets have what it takes to capitalize on their strong economic growth by building financial hubs of the future? Joining me in this panel are Mr. Ibrahim Dabdub to my left immediately, Group CEO of National Bank of Kuwait, Mr. Arif Nakvi, all the way back there from the region, of course, founder and group chief executive officer of um, Abraj Capital, Deputy Prime Minister uh, Ali Baba Jan, His Excellency is joining us for this panel, Samir Asaf, chief executive of HSBC Bank for Global Banking and Markets, and Mr. Ferit Shahenk, chairman of Doge Group and Garanti Bank Turkey. Throughout the crisis, we have seen China as a standing out economy, as the fastest growing economy, replacing Japan as the second largest in the world, and yet taking a step back as a financial hub due to capital controls, currency and transparency issues, showing the world that growth by itself is not enough to establish a city as an international financial hub. The troubled Eurozone countries on the flip side saw their cities decline in the Global Financial Centers Index. Case in point, Dublin, Milan, Athens, Madrid, and Lisbon. Meanwhile, Frankfurt and Paris climbed the rankings as Germany and France proved their leadership, gaining importance throughout the crisis. London, New York, and Hong Kong, the top three financial centers, are still controlling the 70% stake of the equity trading worldwide. But as the report states, they're not untouchable because Asia is rising. Meantime, Dubai in the MENA region has overtaken Qatar. Abu Dhabi is a new entrant to the index above Bahrain. Istanbul and Johannesburg are the cities that prove to be promising in the medium term. There will be many cities that we'll be discussing with this distinguished panel, but before we do, we have a small video for you to watch about the Global Financial Centers Index to see a little bit where the cities will be talking about our place within the index. Istanbul, a city aspiring to be a global financial center, I would like to turn to Mr. Shaheng, if he pleases. Well, group, Doge Group obviously is over 120 companies, not just in Turkey, and Garanti Bank is the biggest bank by deposits in Turkey. So it will be interesting to start with you to get your opinions on what makes a global financial center and whether you think Istanbul is ready to take on the challenge. 
If you don't mind, I'm going to summarize the whole issue, not from a Turkish prison or a Turkish prisoner can perspective, but from a uh, international national perspective. I think that it's more clear wh where Istanbul stands today. Uh, we all know about the global landscape in the uh, economic arena. Uh, we are seeing new growth centers and a multipolar global economic system within an increasing way going towards emerging markets and emerging market players. The economic power also moving from north to south and west to east. Uh, 15 years ago when we looked at this picture, emerging and developing market economies accounted for about one third of global GDP, while uh, advanced economies were the two thirds. With the rise of a multipolar world and the, what's happening the last couple of years, we are seeing that both are sharing this GDP 50-50. So the shift clearly shows that there's something happening in the emerging, ma emerging market uh, as players, as competitors, and also in the financial arena. Another thing maybe it's good to talk about is that the idea or the evolution of uh, new financial center is not a plastic or an artificial setup designed by uh, emerging market authorities. Uh, I think it's a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that you compete with the reality. And uh, because of the new world order in economy and trade, it's becoming a natural one. It's not a plastic one anymore. But you have to buy into the authorities' efforts, the citizens' efforts, the players' efforts in this ballgame. So we have to look at it from a, what we collaboratively should do is how we can change the transformation into a success story, if you want to call it that way. A well-functioning financial center obviously improves efficiency of fund transfers, economic wealth of that specific country, region, and also the global wealth. On the other hand, an immature financial center with lack of legal, institutional, financial and logistic infrastructure will pose an important source of financial systematicness for the global economy. What are the main features of global financial center? I think there are three prime factors. One is the pool of money to lend or invest. The second one is decent legal or institutional framework. The third one is high quality of human resource and technological infrastructure. A financial center has to be a place where massive amount of supply and demand of funds with different taste and appetite of investment find each other at an acceptable rate of return, at an acceptable rate of cost. Uh, so the all parties which give and take have to benefit from all this. Hence, amount, quality, and variety of financial sources do matter. The volume and the value of trading, but also the cluster effect of the number of different financial service companies at the location is important. This means we need deep, diversified, and well-functioning markets. Another crucial factor is the establishment of legitimacy and trust. Regulations, tax rates, economic freedom, investor protection are all must as well. These factors are necessary, but not sufficient proof. Availability of skilled workforce, flexibility of the labor is also a must. Now, looking into Istanbul, if you want it that, that way, I think we have the commitment of both public and private sector, first of all. The secondly, we have the human capital with crisis experience. <laughs> Third, location is an advantage for us. 
The project of Istanbul as a global financial center is a top priority for both public and private sector in Turkey as we speak. Because we need this move to leverage our step to the League of Advanced Economies. Turkey as very well functioning open market economy has been growing at a pace of about 8% in a couple of years, despite the global crisis. This was the blessing of prudent macro policies and reforms. But to finance a micro transformation, we have to be the place for global funds and global financial intermediation. All parties of the society are aware of this and anonymously support this project very much. Public authorities do their part with a comprehensive, well thought and timely agenda to improve the legal and institutional structure, which I'm sure our minister would explain in detail better than most of us. From private sector's perspective at every platform, we face a significant interest for investing in Turkey. Hence, we put special emphasis on Istanbul as becoming a global financial center to efficiently and securely intermediate massive capital flows to our country. As a private sector, we want to expand our global operations and partnerships. Also for this purpose, we strongly support the vision of Istanbul, a global center for all sorts of financial activities. And we do our part by investing in technology, infrastructure. Our financial institutions are worldwide known with their customer-oriented, fast and high-quality technological services. You said guarantee bank, but I would like to comment in general. Turkish banking is recognized globally as a financial sector operating with the best technological infrastructure. In Turkey, generally, financial accessibility is very high. Investors can realize most of financial transactions totally, securely, via mobile devices. I think in many of the established countries, you don't even see this. There are also other advantages of Istanbul. Young and dynamic population, entertainment, qualified labor force, diversity of financial products and services, and geopolitical advantages are among some of these. Especially the presence of a skilled and experienced human capital base in all related disciplines brings Istanbul one step forward among her peers. Surviving a series of major financial crises during the last decade and witnessing a comprehensive restructuring of the whole financial system, our workforce in financial sector is skilled and very experienced in managing risk and all kinds of unexpected conditions. The final advantage I want to mention is our location. At the crossroads of Europe, Middle East, Caucasus, in at most four hours, we can reach all the globally significant destinations within the region. Istanbul has the potential to become an important center for gathering and redirecting the financial resources of the region. In fact, our city, Istanbul, has always been the well positioned to serve as a regional financial center. Its strategic position and geographic advantage were always there. But there were some other factors blurring this bright picture. I think first and foremost, the macroeconomic environment of the country, which in turn is dependent on political stability, was the key factor. And we have clearly seen that macroeconomic stability was finally achieved only after political stability was in place. Turkish financial markets serve to the interests of all sorts of investors from different regions. We have totally liberalized so as a, as a summary, I think we do have all of the reasons to be the center and we are going to fight for it. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, one of the subjects that you touch, touched upon actually is political stability. It turns out that since 1950s, maybe for the first time, we have over a decade um, the same government, a one-party government. We have, as you have mentioned, the strong banking system who has been through the 2001 crisis. The mobile usage, Turkey is number one with the young demographics. Istanbul is the ninth city um, when we're talking about Congress centers. But at the same time, I would like to turn to my neighbor, uh, Mr. Dobdub at this point, because he has come to Turkey to study in 1957, and now he's on the board of advisors for Istanbul as a financial center. Looking from your perspective, National Bank of Kuwait has all kinds of investments, starting from London all the way to Shanghai, in a variety of financial centers. When you look at this region, do you feel like Dubai is more visible than Istanbul? If not, why not? I promise Arif not to attack Dubai. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not going to attack Dubai, but okay. basically Fair Dubai, enough. Dubai, <laughs> We can attack it with uh, Mr. Nakvi later. <laughs> the, way, the way I see things are is that there are three financial centers in the world. The, re the real financial centers in the world are New York, London, and Singapore. So basically there are many, many small financial centers, but these are the major financial centers. And the three, by the way, they, they operate uh, in, a, in a single currency called the dollar. And of course the euro, but the euro now is under questioning. So we're talking about one currency in the world and three finance, uh, international financial centers. But to create a regional financial center, but not international financial centers, maybe at some stage, maybe. When you talk about Shanghai, Shanghai is not really a financial center. It's a, it's a large economy. But until such time as the authorities decide to internationalize the UN or the Remnimbi, until such time as they have credible uh, legal infrastructure, until such time as they open up to the world, we, uh, Shanghai will never be. Hong Kong may be in the future because Hong Kong already, uh, before 1997, had some sort of, an inst of a structure before, before uh, it joined China. So basically, and I don't want to be pro-Turkish pro because I, I studied here in Turkey and I, I love Turkey, but I think, and I will, I will be ready to, to work with Mr. Babajan and his colleagues uh, on Istanbul making it a financial center, and I'll tell you why. First of all, Turkey, the size, and these, the factors, let's say, for, for a financial center. One is the size of the economy, definitely. You cannot have a small economy Really, it has to have a very large, and Turkey has a one trillion dollar economy. Two, you will have to have a first class, legal, credible infrastructure, really, in order that people can really say, we have laws, we have uh, the legal infrastructure. Three, you have to have institutions. You have to have banks, and I'm, I'm proud to say that the Turkish banks, not because Farid is my friend, but Guarantee and Akbank and, and Ish and all the others are first class banks. And, and I personally learned from them, really. So that the, these, we're talking about institutions. Three, the geographic location. And Turkey has a, it's in the corridor to, to between the East and the West, between MENA and, and Europe. The a first class location. Four, the lifestyle. Lifestyle is acceptable to many, many uh, uh, nationalities. It's not just one nationality, anybody, and it's international, especially Istanbul is international. And then the talent. As I said, in Turkey, we have good talent, first-class talent. When it comes to banks, we have first-class education. I studied in Ortadu in Ankara, and I know the quality of the education in Roberts College, in the old Roberts College, and in other, in, in uh, I forgot the name <laughs> of the, the universities, Boazici, everything. And then the only thing, and, and political stability, like you said. Uh, uh, Turkey has been very stable politically for the last few years. The only problem with Turkey, and excuse me, Mr. Babajan, is the language. All financial centers in the world use the English language, whether we like it or not. You have to be able to communicate with people. And Istanbul has to start teaching its boys and girls English right from the primary school.
That's how I look at it. Thank you very much. Of course, let's hope that with our young demographics, we'll you know, give more emphasis to education so we can catch up to your high standards. We have to be able to communicate in English because, as I said, English is the international language for business and for international finance, no matter what. Mr. Nakvi. Yes. Now, Mr. Dabdub said he's not going to attack Dubai. And but I've been getting a lot of tweets about Dubai, so I can't help. I have been to Dubai, <laughs> <laughs> stood on top of you know, Burj Khalifa, looked down. It's a man-made miracle. All kinds of tall buildings, and you turn on the, the other side of the telescope, and it shows you desert. Wonderful. It was desert. Now it's millions of dollars. 85% expats. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Dubai has obliged to FSA, has introduced FDIC, so everything is internationally coordinated. So you can communicate with everyone, you have their legislation, everything is good. But I have been talking to a lot of people about this, and some people argue that since Dubai had an inspiration to become an Islamic financial center, everything had to be based um, on asset backing securities, and then due to real estate, Dubai failed. Do you agree, do you disagree? Uh, no, I completely disagree. Because okay, tell me. And, and it sets the stage for a good debate. Uh, it's what we do. Well, the starting point is you can't say it's been a success or a failure because I believe it's work in progress. Okay. okay. And Dubai is a phenomenon that as a development by itself is only about 15 years old. It's based on a vision. It's based on a gap, a market gap that existed, which was between London and Singapore. There was no real established financial center of repute. And you have to remember that it was the gateway to the Middle East region. Now, the Middle East region has one very important fundamental strength, which is, whether you like it or not, 65% of the world's energy reserves, oil reserves, are under the ground in the GCC. They only produce every year 30% of global production. Now, that mismatch, it doesn't matter whether you think oil will run out in 30 years or 100 years. That mismatch means that the GDP and the economy size in the GCC countries is going to keep increasing. So what Dubai had as a starting point is it created itself as the gateway to a region. Uh, it has an enormous amount of foreign companies, service companies that base themselves there. And more importantly, these companies have people that live and work there and find it a very conducive environment. Mr. Dabdub earlier was talking about culture and language and so on. What Dubai has created over the last 20 years is something that very few other cities can, can claim to do, which is it has created a cosmopolitan culture. Whether you're from India, or whether you're from Pakistan, or whether you're from Egypt, or the United States, or wherever, people feel at home in Dubai. Let now, me ask you another question. No, hang on, I haven't finished. Okay. So, so <laughs> since you asked, the tweets haven't stopped here. So, so, so going on from that, what it then did is it said, let's be a financial center. We are a global uh, location. Today, its airline is one of the top five in the world. Its airport is one of the top five in the world. Jabal Ali is one of the largest ports in the world. And I can keep going on and on. It's one of the f five main tourist destinations in the world today. And like you said, it was a piece of desert. So something must have been done right. And on top of all of that is a financial architecture that seems to be working. So if you ask me, my vote is absolutely there. But I don't have to have a vote that says Istanbul cannot succeed or Mumbai cannot succeed or Singapore cannot succeed. Our markets are so large today, and the future is so comprehensively ours, the people who live in these markets, that we can have five such centers and still not have, have enough. Let's see if you agree with me on another point. Talking about Istanbul or Dubai, I've also been getting some tweets about Sao Paulo or Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Do you ever feel yeah. like these emerging centers have already emerged? Okay, let's, let's just agree on one thing to start with. Okay, and I hope your audience agrees with me and all the people that are listening from outside. Can we please stop calling these emerging markets? What these, do you want to call them? These have already emerged. Two-thirds of global growth is happening in these markets. These markets account for uh, 1.2 billion people in the middle classes. That's more than the population of the entire OECD. The collective share of these economies is going to far surpass that in the so-called developed markets. Please call them global growth markets because that's what they are. The entire world is looking at these markets and saying, this is where growth is gonna come from. The same organizations in the West that have built enormous, successful, good franchises in their countries are now turning to these markets
to support and supply their growth going forward in the future. So I'm very clear in my mind, these are not emerging economies. They have emerged. That's point one. Point two is when we look for financial hubs, you have to remember financial hubs only get created around real economic activity. You can't create them in isolation. So the success of Dubai was the oil market in the GCC. The success of Istanbul is a fabulous domestic economy that grew 8.5% last year and the year before, that created 3.5 million jobs. It has, without question, a right to consider itself to be a financial hub. Whether it goes from what Mr. Dardug was saying, a regional financial hub, to a global financial hub, needs a couple of more things, okay? You need a first-class infrastructure. You need language, obviously, that is an important thing. You need technology, you need high-class universities to provide the pool of talent. But you know what? It's got all of those attributes already. So in my opinion, if we go forward 20 years, and if the same meeting was held 20 years from now, I have no doubt in my mind that because the world is changing, and because systemic risk, as we referred to it in 2008 and 9, actually came from Western markets, okay? The, the increase in economic activity that is happening across these global growth markets is going to force and create Istanbul and Dubai and Mumbai and Singapore to be hubs of criticality in the future, not just importance. One of the things that you touched upon actually inspires me to speak about something else. I have watched one of these panels by the Istanbul Suk Exchange chairman and he proposed you know, a good solution may be a network of uh, stock exchanges or exchanges to keep the you know, capital markets flowing. And actually, HSBC had a very interesting report on uh, a similar subject because Istanbul Stock Exchange, soon to be Istanbul Exchange, has signed an agreement with the Korea Exchange recently. And the chairman there said, why don't we revive the Silk Road? Now, HSBC, you know, a heritage of 145 years old, you know, you're a globally local bank. You have exposure to all kinds of these markets. Of course, it will be interesting to hear what you think about the Silk Road, whether it can be revived, whether that's a good idea. But also, HSBC is interesting because of the news flow, because there has been a lot of rumor, a lot of news recently, whether on you are going to move your headquarters from London. You know, you are, you know, officially Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation. So, whether you have any plans to move your headquarters to any of the emerging countries. What would it take for you to move it? Let me start by saying that at HSBC, actually, we call the countries that you've mentioned now the fast-growing countries, actually, to avoid the emerging market countries affiliation, which is probably much more appropriate. Uh, secondly, maybe to contribute to the debate of the financial hub because before I go to the specific HSBC headquarters, uh, just to say that, uh, you know, Historically. May I just remind you that as the, all the other panelists, I can give you a limited amount of time. Fine. So how remind much I have? 30 seconds? No. Okay. So more. historically, historically, actually, financial hubs, uh, you know, were built uh, uh, around two different concepts. The first concept is more a, a, a concept of a domestic conduit, which the biggest example is New York. The second concept is a connectivity concept, which the good example is London or Hong Kong or Singapore. So we have to distinguish among these two concepts and actually for Turkey, probably to go forward needs to define a little bit more which of the two hubs would, would like to, uh, to, to, to create. Thirdly, I think that a lot of uh, things have been said around uh, you know, what's good uh, to be a financial center think that, uh, in, and in the case of Turkey, absolutely Turkey can be at least a regional financial uh, hub uh, as long as it defines which kind of, of hub it, it would want to be. But, you know, maybe there are some challenges actually that needs to be met yet in the Turkish situation in order to go there. Yes, the uh, education here is fantastic and the labor, uh, la labor uh, work is, is very skilled a part of some language center, but uh, the, actually the labor market is still pretty much rigid and a financial hub necessitates actually a much more flexibility in the labor market. Uh, the economy is very strong. Turkey has grown fantastically when the last few years and actually our report uh, HSBC 2050 sees Turkey growing to, the, to becoming the 12th largest economy in 2050, which so is... We want a, to be in the top 10 in... 
2023. So uh, there is uh, a 20 I'm, minute I'm gap sure there. I'm sure that the, the minister will do, uh, you know, will accelerate the pass uh, in the next few years to become top 10. But uh, uh, at least uh, being number 12 in 2050 yeah, is already. Mr. Uh, Dabdoub is also asking which day, which day in 2023. 2023. So one more. I said what time? <laughs> Question to yeah, Deputy Mr. Prime Minister yeah. later. But but what is important is is uh, actually to re-equilibrate this economy to make it much more stable in the future. And obviously, this economy is still pretty much dependent on import on and on domestic. And obviously, re-equilibrated a little bit more toward exports and creating a, a better saving environment to, to make it less dependent on the short-term flows. You know, is, 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 these are good steps in order to, you know, to allow uh, the Turkish uh, uh, economy and Istanbul uh, to become a much more stable and predictable and much more transparent financial hub. So these are the three points that I wanted to make on these topics, but obviously Istanbul has all the right to win becoming a, a financial hub. While a HSBC, actually, as a global, uh, a, a global company, to get back to our London headquarters, actually we've decided not to debate this topic anymore till the regulations would be much clearer in order to, uh, to decide where we go. So we have no discussions anymore about, about this topic. But what is very, very important, and it relates to, to the Turkish debate as well, is to see if we want to become a financial hub, regional, or uh, what's the appetite of the regulators you know, to open up you know, to get all the licensing necessary to have the, uh, the international banks established here. And then what's the appetite of the regulator to see the size of the financial sector compared to the size of the real sector and how much, you know, the country is ready to take the risk of if there is any problem, you know, to bail out the system or to support it in, in a way or form. And this is actually the bulk of the debate for the time being happening across all geographies and uh, across all governments and the regulations. And what's the balance between wanting to be open and wanting to be a real financial international center? And on the other hand, how much we are ready to support it and how much the local economy can take this, uh, this, this sizable risk. Now, we have started the round with the private sector from Istanbul, from Turkey. Let's finish the round with the public sector from Istanbul, well, Ankara, so Turkey. Uh, turning to His Excellency, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Ali Babacan, of course, we have heard the comments uh, of the panelists, but I have some more areas on which it has been touched upon on the many panels that I have watched before this panel about Istanbul being a financial center, potentially. There have been a lot of points being raised. One of them was, of course, also touched upon here, which is international compatibility in terms of tax, in terms of legislations, regulations, and language. Apart from that, on a more day-to-day -day basis, if we want to attract more talent, a lot more brain here in terms of finance, people have mentioned, well, if I move there with my family, how many expat schools do you have where I can send my kid? There is the British school, there is the International Community School. I went to an Italian high school, there were two Italian kids in the whole school. So maybe that could be a, a subject we could touch upon. And another subject that has been interesting is on, in terms of commitment. There has been you know, a lot of mentions about whether a ministerial effort will be put towards Istanbul being a financial center, or maybe there can be an agency level um, plan for this sort of aim in terms of showing more commitment towards this goal. And um, of course, the IIF's Dalara said Singapore could be an example. So we are wondering if any kind of, I don't know, membership from Singapore to an advisory board in Turkey could be possible. So those are the points that have stood in my mind that I have been meaning to ask you. But of course, Mr. Dabdub's question is also very interesting in 2023. Can you give us a date on when we will reach a two trillion dollar economy and make it to the top 10? Well, uh, now <laughs> it's a good start, I think. <laughs> listening, listening to uh, all the all the panels, I think there are so much commonalities and so many same points that have been having, having that have been emphasized. But uh, probably I should start with uh, overall global growth markets or fast growth markets, but however however we can call it. Okay, <laughs> good good terminology. Uh, the, 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 I think there are, there are many commonalities which is going to make uh, 
these countries be more and more visible and <coughs> be more and more effective in the financial sector. Uh, for a city, for a country to become a regional or a global uh, financial center, I think there are two important elements which uh, is the basis, and these are stability and also confidence. Uh, if the country overall, if the macroeconomic situation of that country is not stable, or if the, the confidence is questionable overall in the business and financial sector, then it is really difficult to highlight that country or, or that city as a prospective uh, global or regional financial center. Uh, the size also, of course, important, the, the market size, the population size, because the critical mass is important to uh, bring together both the providers of the assets and also uh, purchasers uh, of, the, of the assets. Uh, legal framework, rep reputable courts, whenever there are disputes, if they are taken to the courts, should be finalized fast and in a reliable way, which is probably another, another important element which has to be taken into account. <laughs> Logistics, infrastructure, you know, low transaction costs, these are all important elements. And also to attract the talent, lifestyle, overall lifestyle in the city. Education and healthcare is again uh, very important elements to uh, make, make a, a city important uh, financial center. Now, uh, when we look at the developed world nowadays, US, Europe, or Japan, there are uh, serious problems of growth. And it seems that after the crisis of 2008, 2009, the potential growth of many developed countries have actually dropped compared to the pre-crisis level. And what's more, because of the very high public debt and deficit in the developed countries, the financial markets of these <coughs> countries will probably be overcrowded by fixed income instruments rather than uh, equities. And, and uh, this is uh, going to be, uh, in a way, limiting the options for investors. And uh, emerging markets will probably have more options. We'll have more diverse assets to choose from. And also more promising uh, assets, I would say. So for, 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 for investors who really are looking for uh, good gain, maybe some uh, risk, but at the end of the day, good gain, uh, I think it's inevitable that there will be a shift from the developed country financial centers towards developing or emerging or growth, high growth markets. Uh, so, so, so within that, that inevitable shift, which is already happening, uh, how to position uh, Istanbul? I think what we are trying to do with Istanbul Stock Exchange nowadays, and the new chairman whom we appointed is now working very hard on that, is to form alliances. Because at the end of the day, in today's age of technology, the location is losing its importance to a certain extent. Uh, and having a good technology platform, a reliable technology pro platform, which actually cut across the markets, is going to be a very valuable asset for, for, for future. And that's why uh, with, with many countries, with many uh, stock exchanges, Istanbul Stock Exchange has already signed MOUs during the last several months, and there are many operations coming up, and uh, Istanbul Stock Exchange is very interested in buying shares in quite a few stock exchanges across this, this region of form alliances, partnerships, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so having easy access and also having, uh, making, the, making it easy for the investors to have access to good information, especially in less known markets, is probably going to be more and more important uh, service that the uh, uh, financial centers will be providing uh, for, the, uh, for the investors. Uh, another aspect is that in many developed countries, public debt and high deficit uh, is going to cause increasing taxes. Now, financial transaction ta tax is widely discussed within the European circles. There are many countries who are actually pushing for that. And uh, again, in London, the personal income tax 
has been increased tremendously, I would say. And on the other hand, many emerging countries, including, uh, including Turkey, Istanbul, uh, we have low deficits, we have low public debt. So we are not going to be urged to increase taxes or whatsoever anytime soon. Actually, we are doing just the other way around. For example, for fund managers doing business in Istanbul, we just passed a law which simply brings the personal income tax level to zero. It's an additional business for us, so we don't really care. Uh, the, the lost taxes also, but because it doesn't exist much, much anyway. And we believe that uh, this is, steps like this is going to be uh, more and more uh, attractive. Uh, human, human resources, uh, talent. Uh, when we talk with many multinational companies doing business in Istanbul, or many international financial institutions doing business in Istanbul, and when we ask them what is special about Istanbul, the most frequently named element is actually human resources. Because the Turkish professionals, Turkish businessmen, it's very easy for them to do business in uh, Europe, in Russia, in Africa, in Middle East, in Central Asia. So wherever they go, they do business very easily. They can mix in. They can be easily understood. It's easy for them to understand people. For example, uh, IFC, the private sector arm of the World Bank, has picked Istanbul for their regional operations center. And uh, actually, not just an operations center, but actually they do lending out of Istanbul. Uh, and, what, what, and that's their very first office outside Washington, D.C. that they are doing it. And they are looking after Eastern Europe, Russia, North Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, and so forth. EBRD has opened an office in Istanbul for the same region. From the corporate sector, Microsoft, Istanbul office, is now overseeing 79 countries. Coca-Cola, Istanbul office, Istanbul regional headquarters, oversee 93 countries, including all of the continent of Africa, uh, Eastern Europe, all the way to India, including India, is managed out of the Istanbul office. So, uh, Turkish Airlines now fly to 200 destinations. Only in Africa, 20 destinations they fly. And why, why, why I am giving these examples is that the momentum is already building up. Actually, as the government, what we need to do is just to prepare safe, strong grounds to let it happen and keep the costs low, keep the tax low, and also just help with some, some infrastructure and to lift the barriers so that the potential will be uh, unleashed anyway. So uh, that doesn't mean, of course, we are going to, to that doesn't mean that uh, we don't have any homework to do and so forth. We have just... Uh, actually sent laws to the parliament, which is to be legislated very soon, uh, for a new uh, capital markets law. A, a new law for non-banking sector, because the banking law for us is already quite a good one. And uh, a law for a new arbitration center in Istanbul, so that for companies who don't want to go to courts, that arbitration center, which is going to run by the private sector anyway, is going to handle things. Even for courts now, we are uh, having specialized courts in Istanbul for the financial sector, so that if so the people don't have to go to courts who don't really understand subjects, but prosecutors, judges, who are specialized uh, in this area for them to make fast and reliable decisions. So, so all these are the things which we have been working on. But I think one last thing which I want to say is the very important uh, test that Istanbul has passed, which is the crisis of 2008-2009. The firm regulation and supervision scheme that we have introduced timely before this crisis protected our banks all throughout the crisis. We didn't have any banks going through any kind of difficulties. No bailouts, no government support whatsoever was necessary. Even for those American or European banks which had problems at home, deep problems, their Turkish operation, their Turkish subsidiary was very, very strong and safe throughout the crisis. And for those banks now, the Turkish operation is their uh, most valuable asset overall. So uh, again, going to the very first two elements, stability and confidence. Of course, it's a long-term subject. It's a long-term concept. Uh, confidence doesn't happen over time. It takes time to build it. And I think Istanbul is already building 
that confidence at a pretty good pace. Thank you very much for your remarks. Now we would like to open the panel to your questions and comments. If you keep the questions brief, it would be appreciated to maximize the panelists' time of speech. May we have a microphone for the gentleman in the first row, please? My question is to Mr. Dabu. My name is Guru Lalwani. You mentioned the three largest centers being New York, London, and Singapore. I will start with London, New York, and Hong Kong, because the task of the CEO of HSBC, and I've been a long term shareholder of HSBC, and they are a global bank. They've got large assets in the Far East. They made a lot more profit in Hong Kong than Singapore. So would you say Hong Kong is a Far East financial center or Singapore? It's like uh, Dubai and Istanbul, actually. So I don't want to get <laughs> in. <laughs> <this place. laughs> but, but, yeah, but but obviously, <laughs> obviously, if you consider the size, Hong Kong, it's much bigger uh, capital market than Singapore. Uh, uh, but the, you know, the proxy to China is making the Hong Kong situation. And uh, absolutely a, a must these days. The, j I just have to remember that IPOs in 2011, Hong Kong was the largest market in the globe, and the market cap of Hong Kong actually is now the third or the second largest market yes, cap and Hong Kong in the world. Is, uh, will, will become, in my opinion, will become a financial center soon. I thought but it is already. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think it is because, because China itself is still closed. It's opening up, but slowly it's opening up until you internationalize the currency. The yuan and renminbi is still a local currency, no matter what, the laws, the opening up. And I think Hong Kong, as I said before, has the, the fr uh, infrastructure from pre-1997. Of course, it's an advantage. I think if it opens, Hong Kong will be bigger because it's, it's part of China. China is the second economy or the third now economy in the world. And Probably in 2023, on the 10th of December, it's going to be on the 10th one. of December. <laughs> going to be in the number one economy. I agree with Mr. Nasser, but I think Hong Kong is far bigger than Singapore. With due respect to Singapore, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, think things, is I think there's some things that are just facts, right? Facts, New York, London, Hong Kong. That's right. That's a fact. That's what I want to stop. I think, I think more, if I can just add to that, is the dimensionality of the Far East, right? The importance of Singapore to Western capital thinking about China arguably could be what was said earlier. But, you know, Hong Kong is Hong Kong. Thank you, Mr. Lalwani. We have a question from the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers, the youngest generation. So we're talking about the financial hubs of the future. You are the future, so ask. <laughs> Fire away. is to achieve this. Well, the first one is obviously uh, you can grow a lot of stretches in an economy or in a country. If you don't have a government who will do this and who will stay behind this, forget the whole thing. You will never achieve where you want to get to. I mean, Turkey have went through 17, 18 IMF program and from 2000 on, uh, today's government has uh, achieved it. Uh, otherwise, many of the institutions in Turkey were the same, but with the economic stability, accountability, that confidence building has brought Turkey to a certain level. You look at the volumes of the companies, the market cap, everything changed. We are the same people, we are the same management, we are the same owners, but the platform that we work on has changed, and that's Politicians. Uh, if, I, uh, if I may add, I think that stability and predictability as well you know, is a very, very important uh, factor. And predictability hmm? is not only no. about macro predictability, but the predictability mainly about the regulatory regimes and about the tax regimes. And I think if we can. So I'm not talking about this like this because uh, Mr. Minister is here. <laughs> I think there's one more thing, which is, you know, when we talk about trust, 
and we talk about places like London and Hong New York Hong and Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Yeah, Hong we have to remember these, yeah. the trust in these markets has been built over generations. And yes, Turkey is very exciting, and yes, Dubai is very exciting, and Mumbai is very exciting, and all these markets are exciting, but we've only had transitionary developments here for the last 10 years, 15 years. We need to give it time to work out whether that trust that we talk about becomes endemic in the system. I think one of the important things in Hong Kong is the Chinese authorities, when the transition took place from Britain to China, respected the autonomy of Hong Kong and allowed it and gave it the space to continue to be what it was. And for a, quite a while, investors shied away. They didn't realize it and understand it. But once they realized it's the same place for business, capital flooded in. Because I heard someone on an earlier panel today say capital is a coward, okay? And capital does not have to be a coward, but capital does take very measured decisions around risk, around predictability, as Samir said. And, and this trust factors is one of those things that that this can't go away. <coughs> Let's take a question from the gentleman over there first, and then you, sir, if time allows. Uh, my name is Shirish Sarat. Oh, okay. This is Mina Kasim. And Arif uh, rightly pointed out, he said capital is a coward. My question is to you. Yeah, sorry. I think for the last hour, I love it. <coughs> Today, you spoke about macroeconomic stability as being one of the factors for making a very good financial center, and I agree with that. But your current account deficit as a percentage of GDP is amongst the highest in the world, which would be about 10 to 12 percent, making it obviously that uh, it is financed in some respects by hot money. How do you uh, give the investors the assurance that this is the right ma macroeconomic environment for a financial center? Thank you. Uh, Turkey's uh, external balances are affected by two major areas. One of them is more, more cyclical. It has to do with growth and domestic consumption. But then it also has a lot to do with, with structural elements of our economy. And to deal with both of those areas, we have already started to take measures starting from uh, end of 2010. <laughs> We first started with tightening our banking policies through macroprudential measures, which is basically trying to limit banks so that they don't overlend, and also introduce monetary policy elements, which is going to slow down economic activity and bring the growth at more sustainable levels. So we had very high growth rates, 2010 and 11. But then with the low saving rates in the country, we thought that it would be more and more difficult to sustain this growth purely by external financing. But to do it timely is the key. And we started doing this before the elections of 2011. And it is very important to have the courage to do what is necessary when it is necessary. And we were actually able to do it over the last 10 years during very critical times. And it's very important for the governments and authorities to take measures during good times, like what we have done in 2005 and 6, the new banking law, the new credit card law we introduced. The fact that we increased capital debt equity ratios from 8% uh, to 12%. The fact that we put 25% down payment rule for mortgages. And we did this all before the crisis of 2008-2009. And hence, our banking se sector was very, very safe throughout the crisis. And what we are doing recently for the external imbalances is already starting to pay off. Last year, our current accounts deficit was 10%. And this year, we and also many market analysts expect it to be around 7 to 8% or so. And this gradual decrease is expected to continue. But the real solution of that problem lies in the structural area and in the structural reforms also, during the last one, one and a half years, we have made many, many steps, but structural reforms don't pay off immediately. They pay, it takes time for those to pay. And I think observing what we are doing and observing the measures that we have taken, the markets are uh, somewhat comfortable with our overall economic picture, including the current accounts deficit, yes, but very tight fiscal stance, 
very prudent uh, monetary policies by our central bank and also authorities which can act fast and without the fear. I think that's a very important element. And, what is, and that's what is lacking in many, many European countries right now. I mean, many governments are probably aware of the problems and they are also probably quite aware how to solve those problems. But then the courage to do the necessary steps is the key. And that is probably what is making Turkey uh, different. That is what has differentiated us over the uh, last several years during which uh, the global economy went through huge turbulences overall. We are in our last five minutes, so if you have a quick reaction, the gentleman has been His waiting for that. Is, is biased because he belongs to the government of Turkey, so I would expect that answer to go in a certain direction. But I'd like to say as a foreign investor in Turkey over the last five or seven years, um, I, we have tested the legal system and the deficit hasn't been a new thing. We've tested the legal system, the banking system, the professionals that are available here, the market, and I find that this country is probably one of the absolute best places to invest as a foreign investor that I've seen anywhere in the region in which I operate, which is quite large. Let's so see if the gentleman... That's one as avenue, but as a foreigner, I'll tell you. It's super. Let's see if the gentleman in the front row has anything to challenge. Hamid Zayani from Bahrain. Uh, I, I come to Turkey very often, and if you look at the scene a year ago, you, would, you were very much aspiring to get into Europe. Uh, now, so many things has changed. The euro is uh, one story, uh, the EU is another story. Uh, what do you think, uh, if you want to be a hub center, do you think your, your idea of being in Europe, I mean, obviously Frankfurt and London would not want you to be that way. Okay, three minutes. <laughs> Our, uh, our aspiration to meet the European Union standards is still there and very strong. So our commitment to the process itself is uh, still there and very clear. Uh, we are not that much uh, interested in the practices in the European Union nowadays or the Eurozone practices, which uh, is probably not very appealing nowadays. But just leaving aside the practices, just going back to the origins and looking at the values and the ideals that the European Union represents. And the fact that the benchmarks, the standards, the criteria that this process provides us is very valuable to us. Because we are moving towards improving the quality of our democracy. We are enhancing our practices for fundamental rights, freedoms, rule of law, our judicial system. And without an external anchor, any country can call itself a democratic country. But with the EU process, with the Commission reports, with the Parliament reports, we have this probably this imperfect mirror in front of us all the time to assess how we are performing. And this is still uh, charming for us. And strategically also, Turkey in the EU ultimately is going to be a very, very important uh, element uh, for this uh, part of the world. Now, the World Economic Forum format for these panels is to close with three key points. The three key points I have noted, I don't know if uh, the panel will agree with me, um, is instead of saying emerging for these cities that we're talking about today, let's use global growth markets. Um, stability and confidence are keys on the way to this success story to become a financial hub internationally. And Istanbul proves to be a leading and legitimate candidate on the way to becoming possibly next London within these global growth markets. If you have anything to add, we have one more minute. I guess we all agree on these three key points. All right. In that case, I would like to thank you all for coming, for listening to us. I would like to thank the distinguished panel, His Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister for Economic and Financial Affairs of Turkey, Ali Babacan, um, Chairman of Doğuş Group Turkey, Ferit Şahenk, Ch Chief Executive of Global Banking and Markets, HSBC Bank, Mr. Samir Asaf, Mr. Arif Nakvi, of course, Founder and Group Chief Executive of Abraj Capital, and Mr. Ibrahim Dabdub, the group CEO of National Bank of Kuwait. Thank you very much for joining us on CNBC TV debate.